this bit comes from the Jehan terminal in southeastern Turkey. This is where the oil leaves the pipeline and gets onto an oil tanker and moves across the Mediterranean. However, it could go in a whole range of different uh, directions from this place. Only a certain amount of it is going through to Trieste. Um, some of it, it travels through the Suez Canal and heads for uh, ports east of there. And I'll read this short piece. Oh, don't worry, I'll just shout a little. Shut the mic, okay, if I people shout, if I, if I use my voice a bit stronger, can you hear me? Good. Great. So this is at the port of Jehan in southeastern Turkey. The British Hawthorne, the tanker, will head for Thailand via the Suez Canal, and she is rigged to deter the threat of Somali pirates. All British BP ships traveling through the Gulf of Aden are under instruction to fix double rolls of concertina razor wire around all their decks and carry high pressure water and foam hoses. In the past year, fast skiffs have been launched from coves along Somalia's 3,000 kilometers of coast carrying grappling hooks, rope ladders. Since the Sirius Star, transporting two million barrels of Saudi oil, was captured in November 2008 and held for a three million dollar ransom, tankers have become high profile targets. The vessel and crew are usually released unarmed once the ransom is paid. But shipping associations nevertheless perceive themselves as a system under attack. And the Gulf of Aden is publicly presented as an important energy supply route and a vital strategic artery. Jan Kopernicki, the president of the British Chamber of Shipping, says, I don't want to be alarmist, but I provide essential transport for oil and gas from this country, and I want and England, and I want to provide, be assured that the lights in my home city of Birmingham stay on. Kopernicki is also vice president of Shell's shipping arm, and in this capacity is argued that it's a gaping hole in the UK's defense strategy. UK, US, EU, and NATO forces, including HMS Portland, a frigate, are already patrolling the waters off Somalia as we sit here. They're armed with Lynx helicopters, torpedoes, and heavy artillery, and the Portland can easily overpower the pirate skiffs and the motherships, as they're known. It forms part of the US-led Combined Task Force 151, as do Marines, Super Cobra attack helicopters, and unmanned MQ-9 Reaper drones. The task force is just one of various naval fleets patrolling in these waters. When the British Hawthorne tanker passes through the Gulf of Aden, she will probably register with Operation At Atalanta. This European fleet includes warships in Germany, France, Spain, Italy, empowered by the UN to use all necessary means to repress Paris. Atlanta is run from the Northwood HQ, an extensive underground military complex beneath an oakwood in northwest London, just inside the London's beltway, the M25. Many floors deep behind steel blast doors British Navy officers coordinate the warships with nearby tanker traffic. Vessels are advised to travel in groups and at night. As this, in, as this in quote, enables the forces to sanitize, as the military phrase it, the area in front of the merchant ships. While the action takes place in the Indian Ocean, ultimately control is situated here in the bunker. Major General Buster Howes is in overall command but consults regularly with the most senior officer at sea. Satellite imagery is beamed in from the EU Satellite Center in Madrid and combined with geospatial intelligence. Real-time images are streamed from US drones scouring the waters off Somalia. Communication between Northwood and the shipping companies is conducted by merchant navy liaison officers such as Captain Michael Hawkins. Although he's based in the bunkers, it's part of the military operation. He's not actually a Royal Navy officer. He's employed by BP shipping. So if the drone and satellite surveillance over these distant waters show a skiff approaching British Hawthorne, 
It might be BP's Captain Hawkins, who picks up the phone to meet his headquarters on Sunbury and Thames, just 25 miles away. Backed by global military network, nodes in Texas, Madrid, Nevada, Washington, Brussels, London, and the Seychelles, the British Hawthorne tanker will traverse the waters near Somalia. If need be, the HMS Portland, Reaper drones, or Super Cobra helicopters will be dispatched to ensure that this part of the oil road is sanitized. What I find interesting about that is that we have to understand that these corridors, along which the very essence of our substance, which I talked to you when I mentioned before, that you think about, you know, where did the where did the material that fed the truck or the car or the bus come from? It's not only from deep beneath the ground, but it's also traveled along these corridors. And these corridors are military structures. They're militarized zones. In Azerbaijan, like in the area in Kar Karabakh, they are continually patrolled. In, in at sea, when they come under threat, they're continually patrolled, like in Somalia, but also in other areas as well. And what I feel that that illustrates is the sense in which the intimate connection between our energy needs, or the current structure of our energy provisions, and the military structures, that particularly in organizations such as the one that's in this, is trying to, 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 to question and fight, you know, the struggle against. So I find it interesting that we need, to, what strikes me is that we need to combine both things in struggling to, to, to keep a hold of the military structures which drive us to war, such as in Syria. We also need to tackle the energy system upon which we're dependent. Um, I, I, as I said before, you know, I confess that I come from a, a, a country which has waged wars all over the place, despite what David said, and we've been doing so for at least 500 years. Uh, and, and sometimes I would like to refer to him as little Sparta, because we are, in a sense, your uh, willing poodle slave, whichever way you want to put it. Um, and what interests me is that that has been the case for a very long time. The platform was set up in 1983, and one of the drivers, which is the same as the local peace action group here, and one of the drivers for its establishment was a, a struggle over the cruise missile program, which had been encouraged. We, uh, the British Prime Minister was very happy to receive, Margaret Thatcher was very happy to receive um, uh, at the behest of President Reagan, was the installation of nuclear tip uh, missiles uh, bases in the UK, famous, famously perhaps Korean and Common. And that was a, there was a big social struggle and peace activist struggle around that in the early 80s, a huge peace movement. And, and it inspired us, and we were very involved in that. And of course, in some ways, that was a pretty depressing time because here we are, this nation state, absolutely enthralled to being a militaristic, uh, taking a militaristic role in line with the US. But what I think is quite inspiring right now is just is perhaps a window that we might be about to play a slightly different role. And David uh, mentioned that. But you know, the debate in the House of Commons was not entirely insignificant in helping the global movement towards saying, well, wait a moment, should we really bomb in Syria? And I'm also inspired by the fact that when I was about six, our president, uh, uh, our prime minister, Harold Wilson, also did the same thing there. He was hugely under pressure to send troops to Vietnam. And he said, no, sir, no, thank you very much. I won't do that. Uh, so I think there are precedents that we can hold uh, some pride in the fact of doing that and having that role to play. The final point I'd like to end up is that, uh, and I'll read a tiny last little bit, is the idea that we should understand we need to, uh, I would say, recognize the possibilities of retreat. Braddock, when, uh, after having had most of his force slaughtered uh, or in, uh, in the Appalachians, west of the Appalachians, he, the key thing he had to do was then to retreat. And it's a very complicated thing to retreat. It is said in the, in the analysis of war that the hardest thing to do is to retreat. And 
I'd like to read you a final little passage before we throw it over to you. This is, the, this is about that notion of retreat and understanding how we could utilize that perhaps a military metaphor in relation to the energy system. So at the final bit of this uh, book, we, we take a group of people around, the, around London to look at how London has played a role in creating the R road. And I would emphasize that, as I said, the State Department of Washington did uh, play a key role in it too. We guide the group across the road and down to the calm of Westminster Pier jutting out into the River Thames. The passenger ferry soon arrives and we step aboard. Once we're heading down towards Greenwich, we close the morning exploration with a final story. In the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall, as Azerbaijan, Georgia, and other states asserted their independence, there was a wave of articles and discussions as to how the great and seemingly eternal monolith of the Soviet Union had suddenly melted to thin air. The German writer, Hans Magnus Enzensberg, wrote about the figure of Gorbachev. He said, I declare him to be a modern hero, a hero of a new kind, representing not victory, conquest, and triumph, but renunciation, reduction, and dismantling. Heinzensberger went on to explain that the most difficult of all maneuvers was retreat, the art of withdrawing from an untenable position. Gorbachev had assisted in the process of withdrawing from the untenable structures of the Cold War, of two opposing armed nuclear blocks, of mutually assured destruction. The head of the USSR had understood that the only way forward was by retreating. Enzensberger went on to write that the West must undertake, he said as follows, the most difficult retreat of all from the war against the biosphere, which we have been waging since the Industrial Revolution. He said, certain large industries, ultimately no less threatening than one party rule, will have to be broken up. And this task would require courage and conviction. On the boat, there is something timeless about this winter's day. The tide pouring out towards the sea, the brown river, so unruffled, so unanxious, unstriving. We talk about the state of the River Thames itself, one of the cleanest industrial, ex-industrial waterways in the world, with over 115 species of fish. The river is a metaphor of what can be done, and a reminder that things can change. A survey of the Lower Thames in 1957 found no sign of life except for eels, which can breathe on the surface of the water. Downstream of Tower Bridge in central London, the river was entirely devoid of oxygen. Salmon had been extinct for over a century. Seventy miles of tidal Thames had been given up for dead. It's a position of devastation. And yet, a retreat in that war against the Thames has taken place. Through a myriad of small and large acts, some are the best for the best of reasons and some not. A decline on the industry, on the industry and the banks of the river probably means that some of those factories have been transplanted to other cheaper, less regulated places in the world. And yet the retreat has happened. The Thames has come back to life. We watch a flock of terns, brilliant white, flying over the pool of London. We proclaim that we too can retreat from our untenable position in the war against the biosphere and the atmosphere. With enough bravery, we can retreat from the carbon web and, the, in, 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 and enable in an entirely different future for this city. Question about the the oil road specifically. Um, just how how fragile is it in terms of 
openness to disruption by attack, uh, deterioration just of the pipes itself. Um, can you just give us a sense of, for example, um, what possible environmental hazards there are on the one hand, and on the other hand, what, what would a, a permanent disruption of one oil road mean to the world economy? Extremely interesting question. Um, I think one of the things about that is uh, they're almost assertions of confidence, these things. They're not just physical objects, they're not just a steel tube in the ground, it's about that wide, and you know, several thousand miles long, this one in Turkey and then the one in the Alps. But there are assertions about, okay, if we can do this, it's going to be fine. <coughs> And of course, in order to get the thing financed, the companies behind it and the governments behind it say, it's going to be fine, no problem. But actually, if you look at it, it's, it, the lifespan of a pipeline such as that, and anybody who follows these things can see this actually, even in, in, even in an area where there isn't conflict, such as the Alaska pipeline in, 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 uh, in Alaska, these pipelines are constant, constantly failing. So although they purport to be solid, they're a constant process of, 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 of failure and disruption. Now, of course, to some extent, that's technical. Thing. And it, um, you know, things rust, things don't work, bits of kit. I mean, if you build anybody, anything that's built at that scale over that distance, it's going to, you know, bits of kit don't work. Um, but also, there's, of course, the environmental uh, impacts of land shift, and then crucially, the impact of uh, subsequent and disruption. And that has two, there are two aspects of that which we explore in, in the book. One is uh, disruption by, by states. Um, in this instance, in the, in this pipeline was bombed by the Russian Air Force uh, in 2000, 2008. Um, and the other is by those people use, utilizing the pipeline, seeing the pipeline or such infrastructure as a means of, as a tool in a wider political struggle. So in this case, the pipeline has been burned up several times by the uh, Kurdish freedom fighters, the PKK, um, because they see it as a way of uh, hitting at the Turkish state. The Turkish state in, in, uh, um, in counterbalance see the militarization of the corridor along the pipeline as a way of hitting at the Kurdish uh, separatist movement. So, in terms of disruption, it's constantly disruptive. Um, in terms of its impact on the world economy, that's more interesting, um, a very interesting, more complicated question. Through the pipeline that passes uh, through the Caucasus, which we follow along here, about 1% of the world's oil goes. That's a big chunk of oil. 1% doesn't sound very much, but it's a big one. If it, if it, you know, when it was disrupted, its disruption did impact on the global price of oil. But on the other hand, uh, you know, for a short period, but on the other hand, did the disruption of the pipeline at one end in uh, the Caucasus impact on the place where a lot of it has been delivered to in southern Germany? No, the answer is absolutely not. Because in between that, between those places is these tanker systems. And the tanker systems allow for an enormous amount of flexibility in the delivery of oil. One of the things that's fascinating about oil in distinction with coal, the coal structures of the, from the sort of 1880s onwards, is that coal was a very solid system of delivery between mine and the place of use. The coal trains that came from uh, um, Western Africa, um, Virginia and the Appalachians that deliver a very concrete center of, and there's huge, very little flexibility in that as a means of energy delivery. Oil, on the other hand, it is immensely more flexible. And I would argue, as, as Greg in his book, the, uh, in the Fuel on the Fire, would argue that the war on Iraq wasn't necessarily to capture Iraqi oil fields for the US, but to make sure that that flexibility remained in the global oil system. And what's interesting is that as we shift towards gas usage, to some extent we return to a slightly less flexible structure in 
liquid natural gas, for example, there is a bit of a spot market in it, but it's not nearly as much as oil. It tends to be long-term compromise. And of course, gas pipelines, of which there is one being built in parallel with this oil pipeline, deliver to specified customers. Does that answer yeah. your question a bit? Okay. So we're entering into a slightly less flexible era, which is going to be very interesting.